Um, but I'll tell you what about that trip to the supermarket yesterday. I got there and did the old pocket pat, looked in the car. I didn't have a friggin' mask. Uh, and be the first time, I think, second time. So I thought, damn it, let's live a little dangerously. I'm going to do my supermarket because let's just say the logistics of getting a mask were going to waste my early evening afternoon. So I went and I did my supermarket shop without a mask. I, I observed social distancing where I could. I didn't sneeze on anyone or look any doorknobs. Um, but not from my perception, and I'm pretty paranoid when I'm out in public, from my perception, not a raised eyebrow, not a thing said by the checkout staff. And I've been talking to a few friends who say, yeah, the mask thing, that's over, isn't it? Well, I'm going to say I'm not trying to lead a revolution here. But certainly things are changing, and things are changing overseas. I note uh, reports this morning... We are one of the last countries in the world to require masks on domestic air travel. And there is currently a government review. The government said it would review the orange traffic light setting uh, at the end of winter, and we are sort of, I think, technically at the end of winter. Um, I think it's actually 22nd of September is, is the end of, of winter and the beginning of spring. I would have said the 1st of, of September was the first day of spring. So as we re review the settings, what are the criteria for making a good decision about um, how we live in the times of COVID? And despite the fact that he drives many of you up the wall and you get all conspiracy theory about it, I'm going to give our next guest uh, the compliment of saying at least he fronts and he answers questions and he's not dissembling and he's trying to inform us. And he's giving his honest opinion. So his name's, and he's one of the government's advisors on this and one of the, I think, preeminent voices around COVID for the last two and a half years, uh, Professor Michael Baker. Michael, nice to have you back on the platform. Yeah, kia ora, Sean. Good to join you. All right. Now, there is a review underway. Are you part of that? Are, are you having some input into this review of the traffic uh, light setting? I think that there'll be lots of different groups who'll be um, making their views known at different points and it will feed into a, a government decision. Yeah. Okay. So it is a decision made by the government or by health officials? Yes, that's right. I mean, the US government, but I, I obviously guided by input from various officials. Mm. So, Michael, I, I have to say, just in a personal sense of my day to day life, and I think for many New Zealanders, we are no longer glued to the TV set at one o'clock. It is no longer the leading topic of conversation, COVID. Uh, we've seen, you know, something's changed about the national mood or its perception. But where are we numbers-wise and from a scientific point of view? Are we still in the middle of a pandemic or are we at the end of a pandemic or is the pandemic past? Well, technically the pandemic hasn't finished and it will finish when the virus becomes a predictable endemic threat. And it's not there yet. We will continue to see waves of infection, but the hope will be that the, these waves will get smaller and less harmful. And certainly the, the case numbers are coming down very nicely at the moment. So that's great news. What about fatalities? And what about the proportion of people who are dying of with COVID? Is that reducing or is, is the virus itself still just as potent and dangerous on an individual level as it ever was? Uh, yes, it is just as dangerous. I mean, this um, Omicron is very similar to the uh, in virulence to the virus we had for the first year. Um, Delta was more severe, but this is what the virus does. It goes up and down in severity. But basically, um, without vaccination, it would kill almost 1% of people who got it. The great thing about the vaccine is it pushes that fatality risk down at least tenfold. So at the moment in New Zealand, about one in a thousand people getting this virus are still dying from it. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And the good news is as case numbers drop, for a whole lot of reasons, we get fewer people progressing to go to the hospital and fewer people dying and also fewer people getting long COVID. So basically, it's a really positive direction at the moment. We don't know what the future holds, but certainly the numbers are dropping, which is really good news. All right. Can we model how much more they're going to drop and will uh, a change in, in weather, obviously, in temperature? Are we looking at spring being a time where we cast aside some of the shackles caused by COVID? 
Yeah, certainly we need to be, and, and everyone uses that word, proportionate. Uh, and some controls can go, some controls you'd want to keep. And if you look at the two big areas at the moment, one obviously is about mask requirements. And it will certainly be reasonable to drop mask requirements in some low-risk settings. Uh, but you, I don't think you'd want to stop having masks needed in healthcare settings. So if you're going and you're sitting in your doctor's waiting room with other people who may have respiratory infections or you're in the hospital emergency department waiting to be seen, there are places where I think you want to keep mask use because they do concentrate. And you know what? I think most people would say that's people. reasonable. I think most people would say that is a reasonable and that's not really an imposition. Yeah, and no, I think so. And so that's, that'll be a, a useful change, I think, keeping that policy. In other environments, at the moment, um, we can see that the, the um, percentage of the population who's an active case is po possibly around half a percent of the public. So that means that if you're indoors with 100 people, uh, you've got about a 20 or 30 percent chance that someone else in the room will have the infection. So there's still that risk. But it is getting smaller, and I think there's now this new awareness about the need for good ventilation and so on. So um, things are heading in the right direction. I, I suspect the government will, will probably lighten some of the mask requirements or, or will certainly look at that uh, in this coming review. Yeah. When do you think we're going to get news from this review? And the Prime Minister is being a little bit woofly about exactly what day and when to expect, and I suppose that's to create some wiggle room and give time to get the right advice. One gets the feeling, though, the country is quite eager to be told what's happening. Yeah, look, uh, yes, I, think, I think it's very sensible to review um, those requirements. Now, the other big requirement is isolation when you're sick. And this is quite a different process because this is not affected by the number of cases in the community. It just means that if you've got this infection, you basically need to be taken out of circulation or take yourself out of circulation till you've got better and you're not infecting people. So this means if you have symptoms, stay at home, get a test. And we do know from really high quality data that's just come out recently that at five days, two thirds of people are still infectious. At seven days, it's about a quarter of people. So we, it's hard to shorten these periods greatly without having people who will go off to social events or work or school and infect people around them. Uh, and no one wants that. So mm. this is um, an area where, where test to release is useful, even at seven days, it's good to test. Right, so in other words, There'll don't go back to it until you've had a test and you come up negative and we can say you're not infectious, basically. That's all right. I, I still don't think anyone wants to go off and infect other people. I think we want to avoid doing that. Mm. And one of, the, one of the rooms to move will be that, that this could be shortened to five days if you do two tests. And I think that's one way of getting some people back to work and school a bit mm. faster. Mm. Michael, we've had, uh, I read somewhere the other day, or this week, four times the amount of flu cases this winter um, than usual or than average, which seems pretty bad. But I want to say, prior to COVID, getting sick and staying home from work and not making other people sick was something that we left to the cognizance and common sense of the person in the street or of the business. We did not require government instructions on how long to stay off work if you were ill or if you had the flu. Given that its fatality rate is similar to the flu, why do we need to have this bureaucracy, this central command structure for COVID and not for influenza or for other illnesses? Yeah, look, you're making a very good point and... Um we, one of the legacies of the pandemic, I think we'll move away from the way we used to do things. You remember the whole idea was soldier on with whatever you had. No, no, not necessarily. I think I always found the whole idea was I'm not coming back to work. I don't want to make anyone else sick. Yeah. Well, you, you're probably in that responsible group. And I think uh, uh, it was left to individuals to decide. And I think now there's this realisation actually... Yeah, you're endangering other people. If well, you I'll tell you what, work, but, 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 I think we come to a, f a fundamental problem here, Michael. Um, I don't think there is a realisation. I think there's an awful lot of people who want to say it worked fine before without nanny state telling me what to do. I want to get back to people being trusted to make good decisions on their and others' behalf. 
Well, you could say it worked well, but we had accepted as a society 500 people dying every year from flu, uh, more than the road toll. And, um, you know, just like the road toll when, you know, probably you and I were growing up, there were six or 700 yeah. people dying every year. And we brought it down. So just because it's been the way we did things in the past, it may not, well, it isn't the way that we would do things. Well, it's not to according to people who I guess are specialising in epidemiology and are medical bureaucrats. But to be honest, Michael, they aren't the people who set the policy of a government. That's up for people to decide in a democratic system, not specialist groups. I agree. I mean, our job is to point out the consequences of different policy choices. And government, you're right, is the voice of the people on how we balance these things. Uh, just like the road toll, we could lower the road toll if we said, oh, we're going to drop the maximum speed limit on the open road. But I think as a society, we decided actually we don't want that trade-off, is, is my impression. Yeah, uh, so yeah but we haven't declared, we haven't given Waka Kotahi special powers under special legislation to intrude in our lives and run the country. We are still operating under unusual pandemic legislation which gives health authorities way more say in our lives than they would normally have had or hitherto have had, right? Well, it gives the government the ability to do that, yes. Yeah. And I wonder if, Michael, look, when we talk about measures and what we might do with masks and we talk about... Well, our masks on planes, I just wanted to ask you about that. Do you think we're at the point where that's a bit silly? And I've got to say, I think it's silly when they give me a cup of coffee and a, and a bicky and I take my mask off anyway, but... Um, and I've got to sit right next to someone. Um, do you think masks on planes are still justified with the current transmission rates? and rates of infection? Uh, look, I think it's really a borderline area at the moment. And just like on public transport, I think there is an argument for these really enclosed places where you're, you're forced to sit next to lots of other people mm. for continuing with masks. But I think if the numbers drop to a certain point, and this is where, as you know, with some restrictions, there is no kind of point. It's a continuous distribution. And you have to mm. say, well, we're going to decide that this is the point when the risk is acceptable. And right across society, we're doing these judgment calls all the time yeah. to say that's a risk that we think most people would regard as acceptable. I'm, I'm not sure if we're there yet, uh, but certainly if these numbers keep dropping down, we will get to that point. All right. What do you think that point should be? Or is there any advice or any way we could come to that figure? Uh, well, look, I think when the, when the risk of someone else on the plane having this virus um, drops below 1%, for instance, you might yeah. say that's a reasonable cutoff. We're not right. quite there yet. Uh, so, so I think you can, and this is a judgment call, and obviously it won't please everyone, but it will please some people. Mm. Yeah, Michael, I have to say, look, while I'm sitting here, the texts are coming through, and I'm not going to read all of them, because some of them aren't very nice. And I said earlier, you have always fronted. I think you've always given us your honest responses to genuine questions. You must in some way be looking forward to the end of this because, man, you would have got a pile of SHIT from people, you know, in the public domain and stuff. How are you going? Oh, well, look, um, I, I obviously you, you develop a very thick skin mm. with all of this, as journalists do and politicians, because that is an, that's the name of the business, isn't it? Once you are out there giving a view, I'm, I'm trying to make it based on science uh, the whole way through, other people will have violently different views and, and therefore, you know, you, you, it's a shock when you first get the, this communication. But that's over two years ago now I've been yeah. receiving this stuff. But also you get lots of nice messages as well. I mean, that's, again, the mixture of yeah. people in, in the public who have different views. Yeah. Michael, I'd also like to stay and make the observation that as someone has changed as a doctor, and I guess you use a scientific method of rationality, do you also appreciate that over time, for many of your fellow citizens and many New Zealanders, this is more an emotive or psychological issue about perceptions about how they feel about themselves and the freedoms that they have. And I wonder if people in some instances don't end up talking past each other on the issue of COVID because of that, because of these two quite different ways of perceiving the world or thinking. 
Yeah, and if you look back over the over even our recent history, there were policy changes which were violently opposed. And I still remember when we said, "Oh, the Smoke Free Environments Act means you can't light up, a, you don't have the freedom to light up a cigarette inside yeah. an aeroplane Travesty, or inside yeah. a restaurant." Yeah, and people said that it's just a, a huge, a gross invasion of my um, free will, and. Um, we then would not regard that as acceptable because it's a risk to you if you're smoking. It's also a risk to the people around you. Yeah. And the COVID is very similar. If you are sick and you walk into a social environment, you do, uh, not only uh, it's a risk to certainly the people around you. If you wear a mask, it protects you and the people around you. Um, similarly, all our road rules are about protecting you know you as a driver and the people you might crash into. And over time we've got less tolerant of avoidable risks as a society. And again, not all these changes are popular, but, but often we do them and then we say, actually, that wasn't so bad after all. Yeah. Michael, the other thing, and I'm, this is, I, I'm getting this feedback through the text I'm getting right now. Uh, some people feel that we have given people like you um, an awful lot of power over what we do because of the legislative framework we're currently working under because of the pandemic. And there is a suspicion that people like you have quite enjoyed it and you don't want to cede power back to the people. You don't want us to stop being totally rational about the policy settings and decisions we make. But it does seem to me that we've reached kind of a breaking point in terms of public malleability or acceptance of what in the normal course of things are quite draconian uh, measures. Is there any part of you that is going to miss it when the pandemic is no longer a crisis and you're not perhaps quite so vital or quite so powerful in the context of, of policy making and decision making? I'll, I'll be delighted when the pandemic's finished as a, a public health threat and so I can get back to my the job I'm meant to be doing as a full-time professor at the university. And like for many people, I mean, my other job hasn't gone away, the, the COVID being a COVID, you could say, scientific commentator is an extra job on top of my normal activity. So I'll be delighted when uh, the risk is low, um, we have very few people dying from this infection, and I can get back to my normal uh, job. Michael, I, I thank you very much indeed for fronting uh, yet again on the programme. I'm sorry, there's going to be a lot of negative blowback. Um, but once again, I thank you for your time and I wish you well. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Good to talk. Cheers. Uh, Professor Michael uh, Baker there. So, yeah, he thinks there's probably change coming, masks marginal in some situations. I hope the government hurries up, and I do hope, actually, that we lift the sort of pandemic state of emergency, which currently gives health officials all sorts of power over us. And I've got a question, I think, look, before the pandemic, if you had the flu or you are infectious, you did the decent thing, you didn't come back to work, but you didn't have to have the government mandate that. And I think many of us are just in our spirit sick and tired of being told at the micromanagement level of our lives what the hell we should do. We were good enough as a society to, within tolerable bounds, manage diseases like the flu, manage people being sick at work without nanny state telling us what to do. But it seems now that there is a certain dependence we've created among some people. Oh, I don't know how to be sick and go home and go to bed and take care of myself and decide with the boss when I'm good to come back to work. We better have the government tell us what to do. And it is a mindset. And it doesn't take long for that mindset to be created by a whole lot of government advertising or a daily press conference that reinforces the idea that you look to the state to make decisions which in the normal course of things, you as an individual business, business owner, employee, uh, mother, father, son, daughter, are quite capable of doing. And I think really that's the point that we're at now. We want to say we are all big boys and girls. We do not need you telling us how to live our lives. This is no worse than the flu now. We managed that before, that's okay. And Michael Baker did sort of suggest, oh, maybe we've got to just change the way we think. Maybe we don't. Maybe we don't need to change the way we think. Maybe we have a democratic process of doing that and it doesn't involve, and I'm not getting down on Michael or any expert in particular, apart from Susie Wells, um, 
we don't have to always listen to what the experts say. The experts about how we live our lives, well, we're the experts on that, folks. We really, really are.